Uh, first, uh, thank you everybody uh, who is participating online. Uh, we're really pleased to have you uh, with us. A number of you have sent in uh, some items, uh, some general questions. I'd like to respond to those uh, now. One of the questions is, can we have access to these slides? The webcast itself, as well as the slides, is going to be archived. And it's at the same site uh, that you're now watching uh, the video. So that's where you can get access to the slides. Um, second one, uh, congratulations to the people responsible for the webcast, uh, uh, allowing remote participation. It's TV Worldwide that's uh, providing that webcast capability. Uh, they've done this uh, for other meetings that I've participated in. They're extremely professional. We appreciate their uh, uh, professional effort. Um, another question I, I just I enjoyed just now, the introductions around the table. Is it possible to get a list of those who are attending in person? Yes, we will post that uh, list. Um, uh, on the website and on the uh, NIDRD uh, site. Is there a printed agenda and list of speakers available anywhere? That's being posted um, as we speak, so you should see that uh, momentarily. It's been up on a slide from time to time, but we'll give you access uh, to that directly. So uh, thank you, all of you uh, participating remotely, for sending these in. Remember, you can send in email comments and questions uh, that uh, will be read here during the discussion. So please feel free uh, to participate. Um, next, I wanted to introduce uh, someone who is here participating uh, who is important in the uh, NIDR landscape. And Marcy Gallo is the, uh, is, is the staffer with the lead responsibility on our um, uh, oversight committee, the House Committee on Science and, and Technology. Um, she has stepped into the role that many of you, uh, that, that Jim Wilson uh, previously uh, was responsible for. And Marcy, can you go ahead and come to the front, please? Um, uh, and so uh, Marcy, is, as you, for those of you who know Jim Wilson, uh, stepped in some big shoes, uh, and she's um, filling them uh, admirably. Uh, and uh, she has some uh, uh, information that I thought would be important for you to be uh, aware of. to let everyone know that the committee is working on some draft le legislation to implement some of the recommendations in the PCAST report. And so we're, we're nearing completion of, of getting that draft legislation together and then out to the community so folks in this room to take a look at and give us feedback on, um, on, on the legislation itself and, and in other areas that we might want to take a look at. So I wanted you all to be aware of that effort. Um, hopefully that will be available soon. And um, if you have any questions or comments or ideas or information or anything that you want to give to me regarding the NIDRD program and how we can uh, improve the program, uh, please, please, please let me know. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, let me turn it over now to Fran Berman for the uh, roundtable uh, discussion. You want the podium mic or this one? Right. Okay. This will be our rectangular table discussion. Um, and and um, for those of you out there in cyberspace, we'll be getting um, some written questions. I've already gotten one, and I'm sure we'll be getting many more. Um, I wanted to start um, um, with those of you who wanted to ask Maria questions to give you an opportunity because we didn't get a chance to before the break. So um, let's start with that. Um, any questions for Maria on her presentation or anything else? Yeah, Mike. I'm, I'm very glad that the um, two talks by Jane and Maria are right next to each other because I think they complement each other very well. And they, they point to the need to train some of the students that are coming out of the institutions represented around this table in a way that would make it possible for them to, to teach CS in, in, in high school. How many? people who are getting master's degrees in computer science today actually end up teaching in high school. I, I have no idea what the number is, but I, I, I would be surprised if it's more than 100. How about two? Two? OK, that's probably a good, better guess. Is there something we can do in that area to, 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 to actually help CS students and other students working in computational science to think about a, a, a teaching career that isn't uh, at the graduate level? So uh, perhaps this would be a good time to br briefly mention a program called Math for America, which was founded by Jim Simons 
uh, who's a mathematician who also founded Renaissance Technologies, uh, probably the most successful hedge fund in history. And he started this program in order to get uh, people who are good at mathematics into teaching in public high schools in New York. And there's now uh, uh, chapters or Math for America organizations in about uh, five cities uh, in addition to New York, including Los Angeles and San Diego. And I've been very heavily involved in this program. And I think that uh, a computer science uh, for America would be a very good idea. And in fact, uh, Jim Simons is actually very uh, open to us uh, combining computer science with uh, Math for America in various ways. What Math for America does is it, it recruits people of any age, but quite often recent college graduates, and it pays for them to get a master's of education, including a stipend as well as the tuition. Um, it then pays them an additional stipend of roughly about 20000 a year for their first four years of teaching, and it gives them uh, a lot of mentoring and networking uh, during the first four years to keep them in the classroom and make them, wants to turn them into some of the most successful teachers, but it also encourages them to bring their colleagues from the schools they're in to the mentoring programs and to the various other kinds of uh, mathematical enrichment programs, and I think we need something very much along these lines for computer science. Uh, can I just make one more comment related to that? Jan Cuny at NSF, who's in charge of the BPC program, has this vision that she's going to get 10,000 new teachers in 10,000 different schools, and she's working really hard on trying to find you know, the funding and the infrastructure to make this happen, because as you say, if, even if we invent a new curriculum, who's going to teach it? So, I mean, people are working right now hard on this area, talking to Math for America, talking to you teach and other organizations about that. So, so that, it brings up the issue of, that I've had a conversation during the break of, Jane, Oh, I don't think it's, hello? It, it brings up the issue of the reward, can't, what is the reward system doesn't exist right now. Could there be a reward system within higher ed that could reward people for paying attention to K-12 and possibly teach? And then that's tied in with the lack of prestige that teaching has now, which is tied to pay. <laughs> Um, so there's two sort of parallel issues. One is to up the prestige of being a teacher, and then how higher ed could reward that, and how industry could reward that, because there's incredible talent um, within industry. And um, probably just bringing this up, it creates a tension, because everyone wants to hold on to their good people and doesn't want to let them go. Um, but it, what's the longer good? So I know it's an issue of tension, but we have to figure out some way <coughs> to increase the, t the, teacher, the teacher pool and the prestige of teaching. Jun, you had a question? Jun Yi from University of Iowa. And for, for the kids' education, I have two uh, teenagers, uh, two kids. And I think that the, the parents' involvement and parents' program is also very important to be involved by compare with the Chinese education in China. Uh, most of the Chinese parents are in deeply involved into the education. So the, the, that is one of the issues. Another issue is we have to realize the difference of the culture between today's kids and our generation. And that is another important issue. From the computer science point of view, is it possible to, to so, as soon as possible, generate, uh, as we already realize, uh, generate a fourth generation of programming language, which is more close to the uh, linguistic language, which can stimulate uh, the, the learners to use that language uh, to program, but by embedded into a logical uh, training. So these are the three points I'd like to contribute. Well, the, uh, I, for, first of all, I, I completely agree that uh, parent, parental involvement is an enormous plus, and it's, um, it's very unfortunate that we in the United States have a culture where many parents, when their uh, uh, 
son or daughter has the first difficulty with mathematics will blithely say, oh, I was no good at mathematics either. Don't worry about it. Um, that would be unheard of in China. Um, I mean, it just would be as embarrassing as saying, well, I could never read. Uh, so I, we have a culture change that we need to make for everybody, uh, for all the parents, uh, for all the teachers that expects children to be able to learn mathematics and to be able to learn computational thinking and all of those kinds of things. There is no reason why if you can learn to read, you can't learn computational thinking. Um, the second point that I want to address, though, is actually your third point, is this question about uh, programming languages. Uh, one of the changes that we made at Harvey Mudd College uh, was to move from teaching our introductory course in Java to teaching in Python. And it has been a huge success because it really, for whatever reasons, uh, took it away from being about programming and moved it to being about problem solving. And, and so I am very much in favor of getting away from syntax issues however <coughs> we can do it. And I have to say, you know, I remember um, teaching my son uh, to program in hyperscript and, sorry, and hyper talk. And, you know, just um, that being, because you could read it as a, it looked like English. It was really easy to teach how to program in that. And, um, you know, I, I really do understand that uh, for different kinds of tasks, there are uh, different kinds of programming languages that may be more appropriate. But for getting people excited about thinking computationally, uh, simpler languages, ones that are easy to explain and that are very forgiving, I think are the way to go. Um, uh, let's get to you next, Maron. I didn't want to short shrift the question we got during the last session from the University of Arkansas. And this was for me, but I would be very interested in other people's ideas as well. Um, the question is, you spoke about underrepresentation a bit. How important is it to include geographic diversity and how would you encourage outreach to EBSCOR state? And um, the author says, as an aside, I don't believe there are any EBSCOR states represented on site at this forum. Um, I don't know if that's actually true, but there is. Yes, so good. That's, that's good. Um, how, I mean, my own feeling is when I was looking at the statistics of the science and education indicators, one thing I didn't put on my slides but was on there is um, Clearly, a small number of states have a disproportionate amount of the funding, and it's, it's what one would expect when one looks at ranking of schools. It's the states where the highest ranked schools are. Um, the question is, how do you make this um, science for the whole United States in some way that um, include, that, that continues to um, drive forward the quality but increases the quantity of the number of people that are involved. And I would love to hear from the group um, in terms of people's thoughts on that. Anybody? Yeah, Susan? Susan Graham? So I, I don't have an answer, but it's related to the question that I was going to um, ask Jane, which is how do you, she, I mean, clearly what you're doing now has an educational research component. But looking forward, how can the kinds of solutions you're looking at scale so that you can get out of the large cities and out of the, the highly educated populations and still have the same effects on the school systems? So that's a good question. I mean, it's. I, I'm funded by broadening participation in computing. And one of their new initiatives is leveraging and scaling up. And so we are looking at our own work. Um, as soon as, for instance, this new curriculum has been <coughs> put into really good shape, hopefully next year, we're going to make it available for national distribution. Um, I know that the broadening participation in computing is looking at other pre-college uh, curriculum that is out there, trying to bring everyone together to come up with the best design, make it available. And then I, I think um, Cameron Wilson of the ACM Educational Committee can maybe pipe in here because there's the whole question of 
um, teacher certification programs, which vary state by state. So how can we tackle that? And um, Jan Cuny's 10,000 teachers for 10,000 schools is a definite scale up attempt that how can we take the model of what's been happening in, in Los Angeles, you know, and plant the seeds elsewhere? How can we get the superintendent, the director of science in, in Los Angeles that's been working with us into conference with the directors of Chicago, of Washington, D.C., you know, all over? So there really is an attempt now that we have to scale this up. And the, the challenge is, is bringing all these tensions and component parts, all the pressures that are going on because of educational reform and, and all the different state differences and um, all these people wanting to hold on to their best students, so not releasing them, therefore where are we going to get the teachers? But we are looking at that big picture. And um, I know that Cameron Wilson has a big picture view, um, so maybe he could pipe in here also. Cameron? Uh, so the policy landscape is actually really complicated. Um, I think as many of you know. Can someone um, hand Cameron a, a mic? It needs to be louder. Thanks. They don't all work. So the, the policy landscape is exceedingly complicated in this space um, with federal, state, and local actors, each with varying degrees on what they call learning objectives or curriculum or teacher programs. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not an, it's, there's no silver bullet solution to getting things like Jane's class in every classroom in the United States. I mean, it's very much a state by state, district by district fight. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that I think you go back to, um, something Fran and Owen and, and, and Mike brought up, which is, you know, what can NIDER do, um, the, the, the teacher uh, preparation and um, teacher quality is, is are critical components here, and, and how do you get at that? Um, there, there are a number of teacher preparation programs across the federal government, uh, and it's very few of those have a focus on um, computer science, if at all. And I think that this is something that uh, NIDRD can play a, a particularly useful position in looking across, at least asking these questions about, you know, w what are you doing for the, the teacher uh, preparation, uh, the teacher quality side of things? Um, because I don't think that it can be just Jan Cuny trying to do this at BPC. I think it has to be a, a you know, a coordinated federal government-wide effort. And I know that NIDRD has traditionally focused on um, research and development issues, but I think the la looking at the last PCAST report with the heavy emphasis on workforce and curriculum issues, I think opens the door uh, to having a broader discussion at NCO and NIDRD. Um, you know, I thought Brian had a, uh, Marie, are you following on to that? Brian's got a couple of questions from the web, maybe you can so put like them out. On. Yeah, Maria? I'd like to um, encourage people to take a look at, in, in terms of um, enabling more teachers to teach computer science well in high schools, to take a look at what um, the um, DSH, Digital School Hubs, uh, are doing. This is a project that started in India by uh, Randy Wang together with some other folks from um, the University of Washington. And the idea is that there First of all, there are many schools in India where the teacher who's teaching the subject does not know the content at all. So they could be teaching English, but they can't speak English at all. And so the idea is that they have hub schools where they have, they find a school where there is good teaching. They teach those teachers to teach in the idea that you, you know, you explain something or present something for maybe 10 minutes and then the students maybe do ten, a 10 or 20 minute project around it. They videotape these teachers, and they send the DVDs out to spoke schools, which are schools in the same area so that the, uh, when they're looking at, at the students in their school, they'll feel um, similar to them. So you can imagine African American model and a Latino model for Los Angeles as well as white and Asian. Um, 
and they found this to be extremely successful because what happens is uh, they play the DVD and then the, the students in the classroom where they're uh, watching it, they do the same project and the teacher uh, becomes the coach and what's happening is that the teachers are learning as well as the students being lear learning. So this seems to me like it could be a very, I mean, it was developed for the third world, but um, in, in the United States right now, we are the third world in terms of having high school uh, computer science teachers, and I think it could really help uh, with growing those 10,000 teachers. Right. So, so I, ha I had a couple of comments of my own to make, and then I have some from the, uh, from the internet. <clears throat> the first comment I wanted to make was about back to the ge geographic diversity question. And so, so geographic diversity has always it's been a problem for a long time. It was a problem when I, when I was at NSF 20 years ago. Um, however, the, the number of EPSCoR states has increased recently, or in the last 10 years, I believe. Um, when you think about diversity in the large, uh, and, I, and I'll give you an example. Uh, at our institution, we have an internationalization council, and, and they want to think of diversity on the international scale. And so they arbitrarily, they started to tell us what they wanted in their strategic plan with respect to uh, internationalization. They said, well, we'd like to grow to 9% international students. <clears throat> and so I pointed out to them that you need to look at the symmetry argument here. When those international students come to our institution, what do they see? Well, they see a fairly homogeneous Oregon population. So I made a, I just pulled, went to the web and I pulled down the data and I made a caveat diagram for the domestic diversity in our institution. So, so when we start to think about diversity, we need to, uh, there are ways to start to quantify it and to think about it in a holistic way as opposed to just sort of how much, how much money can I get to come to my state is, is kind of the way. Um, so that, was, that was the comment I wanted to make. There were two comments that I got here. They weren't really questions. One step, it, one says that a big step in increasing diversity is instilling into folks the belief that success is possible. I am not too small or weak to participate. I can get the resources I need. I will be encouraged, not opposed. <clears throat> the larger community, uh, by the larger community and not just my local. So I think this is what part of my message was. I, I think we, we, we uh, over the next two days, we'll solve a lot of technical problems. We'll come up with lots of curriculum ideas. We'll come up with lots of solutions. But right now, we have a motivation problem in the United States, getting kids motivated. And I believe that's, what we need, we need to get back to getting them to think that they are a part of this system and that they can contribute. So that's what that comes from. Can I just I'd say like to, I'd like to, can um, I just say a really sure. brief point? Um, I want to counter that a little bit, which is we found in the midst of poverty of curriculum and poverty of learning opportunities, we found layers and layers of incredibly motivated kids. Um, and so both things are true. There are kids who lose motivation because of the lack you know, of opportunity, and there's kids that are just incredibly motivated and they don't have, don't have so, the opportunity. So there are kids, kids that lack motivation due to, to having uh, too much do that having uh, more resource than they actually can uh, utilize, right? So, so we have we have a middle we have a middle class of, of kids that are just not motivated to go to school and produce. They, they, they're just they don't feel the need. So I'd like to I'd like to add a, a comment. I mean, if if you look at the growing gap between the <coughs> comfort in technology for many kids out in the real world and what they're encountering in their school systems, it's really striking to me. If you look at the number of kids that are on Facebook and YouTube and, you know, multi-role playing games and, you know, listening to music on their iPods and all of that, there's a comfort level and an interest in technology, you know, beyond the kinds of things they're learning in school. There's not a hookup. I think about my own students many, many years ago, and I think about a time when um, the academic sector was the place to do the most innovation where you had the most freedom. I think uh, today's PhD graduates are very tempted to do exactly that in the Googles and the Microsofts and the kinds of things they're seeing out in the private sector, and they're not seeing those opportunities 
um, by and large in the academic sector. I think we have to think about the linkages and the gaps between the world that people actually live in and our entire innovation system is seen in K through 12 and the university system. Maroon, and then uh, CUV number two. Once again, I, I think we have to, to look at the, at the top of the pyramid and that's uh, uh, the, the professors that are leading the field. And I think that uh, a lot of what we are hearing here is a result of, of the culture and the reward system and the interest and the drive of those who are sitting at the top and generating the PhDs and the students and the master students and the undergrads that are feeding into the system. And I think that in general education is not important. In general problem solving is not important. Uh, you will find very few computer scientists that are interested in solving a problem and therefore when you try to bring in uh, scripting languages because people need it, nobody pays attention because they're not rich in one semantics or the other. And uh, if, if we don't address it there, then I, I, don't, think how, I don't see how we build the, the entire pipeline. And somebody has to sit down and try to understand how we change a field that came together when uh, the, the power was six orders of magnitude smaller than it is today, and the usage was also three or four orders of magnitude uh, smaller. And I don't think that computer science, I will talk about computer science, that's what I know, it has ever asked itself, do we need to change anything about what we do given the how many people are using our technology and uh, and that is true for for the students the the, the teachers the the, the 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 k12 and all this so I would encourage everyone to come up with with an effort to really go to the root and because if we don't address it there I don't see how we solve the problem at the schools thanks yeah Uh, yeah, I have a couple of comments and, and one uh, suggestion. Um, I'm coming at this from the perspective of someone who works with state and uh, governments primarily on the relationship between R&D and economic development and workforce development. Um, one observation is that you know these meetings to me always seem to be you know you're preaching to the choir and the congregation is absent because we don't have a lot of education specialists here in the in the room. Maybe some I hope are, are on the web. Uh, and one of the dangers you run into then is that we're talking a lot of ideas that's very difficult for us to get to the implementation stage that, that Mike Nelson talked about. Uh, the other observation is that you know, strategic planning is an exercise in guidance on how to allocate resources. <coughs> and in the NIDR program, you know, the uh, SEW component is about 3% of the budget. You know, the education stuff is 1%. So how can we really leverage you know, that 1% budget or this, how can we leverage this issue to go beyond that 1% of resources? I don't think that... Chris Greer is going to be able to change the university tenure and promotion system, you know, based on, on the budget he has. So one idea I had was looking at new ways of, uh, or new approaches to research that help to engage uh, young people, students, and, and non-traditional research centers. For example, I was at the launch of the uh, Measurement Lab or MLab project at the New America Foundation where every node on the internet becomes part of this research project to understand network dynamics. And that would be one example of maybe a new research model where you're actually bringing research into the classroom or even the homes of a lot of students if they have an internet-capable computer. And really, that, in that way, we're taking money from a, a traditional research project but actually letting it have an impact on the communities and on the, the populations we're really trying to, to reach. So my suggestion would be, you know, in addition to think about these broad topics of diversity and, and access, uh, think about also there might be some ways to implement those ideas within the research environment uh, that could be very useful. Mark, did you have a follow-on to that? Uh, to, to some extent, yes, and I think it's a follow-on to, to, to a number of comments. And the, the, the point I'm, the, the point of my experience is that I come from IBM Research. And one of the things I would dearly love to see is a tighter connection between industrial research and academic research. And I think that, that some of the issues, for example, the ones you, you just brought up, are rather different, the perspective is rather different in industry, 
where I think we understand some of the things that you're, you're concerned about. What, what I, one of the, the best ways of us working together is summer interns. Um, and, you know, I've looked at, at our summer interns, for example, I've had roundtables with them. At the end of them, I've asked how many of them are working on papers that were inspired by the two months that they were at, at IBM, and basically almost all the hands go up, which is a pretty good return on, on their time to get a paper. Granted, they'll have to work a little bit more at, at the university. They never finish in the two months, but they get the start. I've had students who, who've done their thesis based on what they did at IBM. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a fairly good model. In terms of, uh, Bryant, I think you, you mentioned we want to Before one, you one go rate. on, Mark, let me inter uh, interrupt you just for a second. Okay. Do you ever envision that and going the other way, sending someone from IBM to we, the we university? Do have we do have people going on sabbaticals. It's hard because they're established. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to physically move somebody who's got a wife and kids to a different location. Or a husband, or a husband and kids. Sorry. <laughs> I stand corrected. For those of you on the internet, Mark correct. is now melting into the Yes, floor. right. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I was making a demographic uh, statistical mistake, um, which is a problem in its own right. Um, but, you know, Brian, you mentioned that it would be nice to have one to one-to-one -one ratio with, with faculty. At IBM Research, you have five-to-one ratio. We'll have five established researchers for one student. Now, in that context, uh, you know, I was talking to Stu at the break, and both, who works at Google. Both Stu and IBM Research, both Google and IBM Research, have, not surprisingly, a finite budget for, for summer students. One example of a very easy way, I mean, one sort of wild idea is that suppose every NSF grant said, poof, you have money for a student to go take an internship at an at a industrial uh, research center or something that, that they would consider to be good training. I'll bet you we could significantly increase the number of people who would do that sort of internship. I think that that would bring an interdisciplinary focus. Mm -hmm. I think it would give the students training. I think it would make them more entrepreneurial and understand what the, what the, lay, of the lay of the land is and so that when they finally graduated or got their PhD or whatever, they would be aiming at a more, more, they would have a more entrepreneurial focus and know how to think about those things. So I think that they're, I, you know, it's a somewhat wild idea, but I think it has uh, some merit. It would be easily implemented easily quickly. Thanks. Um, we've got some internet questions, um, and then Alan, you'll be next. Did, that was your hand up, right? Okay, you we're just oh. leaning. Um, Jane, maybe? Did you? I thought you had one. Okay, so I have one from oh, Maria. Uh, Jim Kirby, who's at the Center for High Assurance Computer Systems at the Naval Research Laboratory here in DC. And he says there are more important topics, but there are important topics that could be taught in K-12 that could better prepare students for a CS education than learning a particular programming language. And the ones he mentions are lo logic, set theory, finite state machines, discrete math, and computer architecture. And um, I actually agree that uh, one of the things that we ought to be doing is in our math and physics classes and so on, and biology classes, we ought to be integrating computational thinking, which is not all about programming in any, by any means, and, and drawing that link so that when students learn about some discrete mathematics, one of the things they can learn about is that that's a huge part of designing the internet and um, those kinds of things. So, Jim, thanks for that comment. It's a really good one. Just to just comment on that, Maria, I, I'm going to give a talk to some junior high students next week, and I was preparing this talk on the plane coming here, and I was thinking about one of the things that really got me interested, and it was when you know, a teacher was bored and uh, decided to tell us there was more than one kind of infinity and showed us the Cantor diagonalization proof, you know, in eighth grade or seventh grade or whenever it was. It was, it was tremendously exciting. And I think having the time and the um, 
you know, the cycles to do that is tremendously important. It can, it make, it can make a tremendous difference. Anyway, Jake, go on. I, I'd just like to follow up and say, if you look at the work that Mitch Resnick is doing with Scratch and that Randy Pausch started with Alice, programming doesn't have to be what we think of as programming. And it's an empowering and creative thing for students to do. It's not just that we have ideas of what we're going to talk about. Students have to do something. And I'm a big fan of computer science is not equal to programming. But I don't think that we should lose sight of the fact that you can be unbelievably creative and do intellectual things with programming. It doesn't have to be computer science programming. Brian? So uh, related, to, related to that, we have this, uh, we have a, it's not so much a question, but a comment. <coughs> it follows up on what Owen just had to say. One obvious example for inspiring students is games. <coughs> Kids love to play games, and it's a small leap to get students interested in creating their own games. And she mentions the, uh, the <coughs> excuse me, the Alice Project at CMU and the whole serious games movement. So. Uh, I think this is an important, uh, this is important for us. Uh, several places are trying, trying to work on this across the, across the country. I think what, what bothers me is, is uh, where I think NIDRD can, or NIDRD can help make a contribution is in coordination. So that is what this organization is about, and we need to get uh, better coordination. What Mark suggested is wonderful. But it's, a, it's sort of a continuation of the old REU idea, right? We keep doing, we keep doing independent internships, et cetera. And if we, I think if we have better coordination across that process, we could get more leverage out of it. Yeah, the comments Jane made about scale are tremendously important. And this is the kind of thing that one, you know, one can see the federal government taking on. It's not so easy to do it in, uh, in you know, the small scale out in the hinterlands. Alan? Yeah, I, I'd just like to bring a, a, a sort of a new word to the, to the discussion today, and that is the word ecology. Uh, when we start talking about cyber, we have all these com comments about various pieces, and I think we lose the, uh, uh, the em emphasis of how important it, it, to treat it as an ecological system. Where there are dependencies, there's you do something in one area, it affects another one, and we start thinking about these, you know, it's so easy to go down to all these stovepipes. I think one of the things that's important for us to look at is you know, you raised a question earlier this morning about what's the foundation. I mean, we start thinking about this as a whole set of things, so it, it stretches from all sorts of areas. I think it will help our conversation and discussion. Yeah. Speth? So I have a set of hopefully interlocked uh, uh, comments here. Part of the issue is uh, our, our definition of who we are. Um, and we have computer science or, or engineering uh, for many of us, that's the departments we're in. Uh, but we also have on our campuses a college of education. And so many of the people in our field view that education isn't really part of what we do. And so that goes to the heart of some of what you've been talking about. I want to focus more on the issue of the science part because I think that is also an area that is not healthy for several reasons. And NIDRD uh, uh, agencies and initiatives could help there. Uh, in particular, one of, the, one of the facets of science is that we share our results and share in a number of different ways. One way is we share negative results. That doesn't happen. We don't see, in general, publication of experiments that didn't work. And there are several reasons for that. But that means that we can't gain from the experience of where others tried things and they didn't work. It also means that when we look at funding, we have a pressure to do incremental funding because it has to be successful. Otherwise, we don't get more funding. Otherwise, we don't get promoted in tenure. And therefore, we propose small increments, which we may have even already done already because we know that we can show the results and therefore it will be uh, successful. Uh, when we publish too many conferences and journals, we publish items that are phenomenology. They aren't science. There's no null hypothesis. Uh, there's no analysis. We simply show we ran this experiment and here are the numbers we got and we declare it a success. Well, how do we, how do we really define that? How is that advancing science uh, any more than alchemy uh, advanced chemistry? Uh, along with that, we don't publish and make available the data and the artifacts that would allow others to recreate our experiments. 
in the other sciences, this is done as a matter of course to be sure that we actually have accounted for all of the variables and for others to work off of what we have done. That simply doesn't happen in too many areas of our field. We have overemphasis on the speed and size of solutions. Uh, too often, uh, I have seen proposals that people will negatively comment on, even though it's a good idea, because they say, well, that will run too slowly for anyone to use. That's the wrong criteria for science. For applications or building a startup, great. But that isn't science. And what this has led to, because of this mindset and because of not enough funding in the field, we see at many institutions an overemphasis on promotion and tenure based on how successful you are with funding or how many publications you have. So the pressure there is more towards incremental funding to get the money and more towards uh, publishing whatever you can to drive the count up. Those are not healthy for the field and those also don't support us doing work in other things such as the outreach and education. I think we need to, as a community, start evaluating how we go about doing this. And the funding agencies can perhaps help us by encouraging better science, more speculative thinking, and causing researchers to share the results, the data, the inputs, so that others can recreate and check the experiments. Trying to compare two different solutions that are published three years apart in the literature on a whole new generation of machines, a whole new generation of systems, does not provide us a, an adequate means of comparison. So uh, this, is, this is somewhat tangentially related to, to the, these topics, but hopefully those will be of some value. It's right at the heart. That's wonderful. Comment? Yes. Um, I, I agree with what the gentleman said. Can people hear me? OK. Yeah. Um, I agree with yourself? what the gentleman said very strongly. Can you identify yourself? <laughs> uh, Karen Cathedar. Um, I'm actually at the risk of sounding self-serving. I'm a statistician at Indiana University. Okay. And in addition to the list that um, the uh, uh, web um, question proposed, and following on your comments, uh, the value of statistics, which helps with designing experiments, formulating the questions, the hypotheses, uh, looking at the data, making the data available, and making uh, experiments that are designed to get maximum efficiency out of the data um, and drawing inferences from them with um, minimum uncertainty. So a lot of the issues that you talked about, combining um, experiments, meta-analysis, um, are right in the framework of the needs of the tools for computer scientists. I, I wanted to, um, and, and then I'm going to get to you, Marjorie. I wanted to make sure we're keeping up with our web questions. Um, we got one from one of my colleagues at NCSA, and the questions are, um, have there been any studies comparing economic multipliers between industry use of HPC and extreme broadband and citizen use of broadband and enhanced cyber capabilities? How might NIDRD engage with industry for the advancement of U.S. competitiveness and to accelerate deployment of advanced technologies? Um, is there a desire by NIDRD to invite industry HPC users, especially manufacturing companies in the Fortune 50, uh, to participate in a working group? And then last but not least, and I'll, I'll ask for uh, some answers from the floor for all of these, is there an immediate opportunity for NIDRD to lead collaborative efforts with the academic government industry communities in ways that can help model, simulate, and build new energy infrastructure as desired by the new White House administration? Thoughts on that? Yes. Fran, um, in your mm -hmm. presentation, you talked about the need to have a viable innovation system. Yes. And you talked about uh, having collaborations between corporations and universities. You need to additionally call out the need uh, for corporations and national laboratories yes. to collaborate. And, and NIDRD has a role to play in, in making sure that that type of interaction goes forward in, a, in a, an aggressive way. Not just the, the Fortune 50 manufacturers, right. but to get the manufacturing base, the industrial base, largely engaged, particularly with the national laboratories. Because not only do they have the high performance computing capabilities, but they also have the intellectual capital to bring to bear on some of the physics, uh, chemistry problems that the manufacturing base 
uh, has. Yeah. So NIDA D has a, a role to play to keep in mind that overarching innovation, discovery to commercialization aspect that needs to be there so that the uh, developments in the laboratory uh, research uh, community get widely distributed and used. I really agree with this, and, and you know, one of the points I think I was trying to make earlier is that many of these linkages are, they're weak, they're restrictive, um, they're uh, unsupported. It's very difficult to bridge between these different groups in an area that I've been very involved in in cyber infrastructure. Oftentimes we have terrific ideas, um, we have a chance to kind of flesh them out, create you know, fairly firm prototypes in the academic sector, but then just at the time when they start being useful to communities, in some sense in a research model, you have to, you, you know, they drop on the floor. You really, what you really want to do is hand off a successful project for which there's a real constituency onto someone else who will sort of share the responsibility and the cost, whether it be the private sector or the academic sector, to enrich our research infrastructure everywhere. We don't really have good programs for that by and large. There's a few um, stunning other, you know, examples where that's even a part of it. DataNet's a really good example of a, um, a project that looks beyond its end date to what's going to happen after that, and that's actually part of the discussion. But most of these projects, they're not, and it really means that we're constantly just reinventing the wheel or starting over. Um, that's a bad thing for the community. But, but to Mark's um, uh, statement very early about the intellectual property issues that, you know, uh, accompany that transference of, of uh, technology right. out, those issues are, are things that perhaps NIDG could, could look at, yes. uh, perhaps incentivizing a different uh, IP agreement as part of a um, an RFP, you know, uh, partnership request of industry and universities on a research problem uh, of interest that, in fact, if the partners agree, uh, industry and the university agree to go after federal funds, that there is an underlying intellectual property sharing uh, agreement that must be agreed to by the party before the application comes in. So that way you get around the IP issues at the University of um, Cynthia McIntyre with the Council on Competitiveness. I, I think the comment you're making is tremendously important because I think this is a place where the federal government and the agencies, NIDR D, have a lot of influence in creating these new models for right. partnership between, say, the academic, the private sector, or whatever and then, you know, putting them out there, and I think, you know, creative people will optimize for that exactly, system. That's exactly right. Money will create uh, yeah. opportunities. Uh, let's get somebody who hasn't uh, shared. Yeah. So these comments um, yeah, come follow on some earlier remark of this non sequitur uh, character here. But Brian had um, made some, some observations about the motivation of students. And I wanted to make sure we didn't lose sight of a point that I believe Maria had made, and that was the value of having double majors if there are difficulties in attracting people to just major in CS. I mean, today's students, while they may have the sense of entitlement um, that, that Bryant referred to in, in other words, they, they also tend to be very credential-oriented. Uh, and um, following on the comment about, about statistics, I know at, at my institution, uh, both math and CS, and the math has increased its statistics um, uh, emphasis, uh, offer now a Bachelor of Arts as well as a Bachelor of Science. And that makes it easier to have a double major. And then the next step, of course, is to do the, the appropriate marketing. But there are ways that you can talk about the coupling of CS in this instance with problems in biology, problems in psychology, uh, problems in physics, you know, whatever it is, or even in you know, humanities and, and arts. The, the other comment that would make it totally different, but um, since Marona has raised this issue of the culture of the field, uh, in January there was a presentation at the field's uh, major conference of some work funded by the Teagle Foundation about how economics is taught. 
And the interesting thing about this research is the very strong argument that the way that field produces its graduate students, what, what count as success as a graduate student in economics, is exactly not what you want to have in the entering professoriate that is going to teach introductory economics. So to me, there'd be a question of whether that research has parallels for computer science and whether there could be a similar inquiry into the kinds of mismatches that then feed into how would you then fill the gap or, or remediate in some way for the, the future professoriate. That's great. Yes. Panos Ansaklis from uh, the University of Notre Dame. I want to bring uh, up two issues. Uh, one has to do with uh, computer science education in high schools, which was, uh, we spent a lot of time discussing. I see that as part of the more general issue of uh, teaching math and science in high schools. It's embedded in there. And in addition to problems which were mentioned, like the parent involvement and teacher uh, <coughs> qualifications, there are other factors in there, like, for example, uh, uh, other groups like the publishers, where right now, in order to find certain 10, 20 uh, important math facts, you have to dig in a volume of a 1,000-page math book. Okay? And also the other issue of uh, the testing of uh, the different non-for-profit uh, organizations that uh, dominate the testing area and really uh, drive the education system. Okay, so these are important issues to consider. But we are really talking here about uh, creating a cyber, uh, to, to cyber enable uh, the new generation, um, but not only to be good users, but also to design the new systems. And moving into especially graduate education in the US, uh, we may have a problem there, because in the past 50 years, the U.S. has relied on attracting foreign talent to do research in this area. And uh, certainly that's the case, uh, I believe, also in computer science, in other fields as well. Now, with the changing situation around the world, with India, China moving up, there's no guarantee that this is going to be the case in the future, in view of all the other restrictions we have for immigration and so forth. So I agree with the gentleman before who mentioned that these issues of education and uh, human resources in general are uh, uh, more general than computer science. And this is, I, I think, has been pointed out in the PCAST report. Stu, I think you were next. Yeah, uh, a few uh, comments, if I may. There are a few distinctions that uh, we have sort of been brushing over intentionally, I suspect, but partly between a, uh, creating people who are going to be the creators of the science and technology, the people who are going to be the intelligent choosers and users, and then the very broad, simple users. So yes, your entire high school class knows how to use Facebook and almost certainly knows how to do Grand Theft Auto, uh, <laughs> either literally or using the video game. But uh, uh, the question is how many of them have gotten the bug of wondering how it does that. And creating that curiosity, driving that, would seem to be one of the crucial points about creating this much larger part of the pyramid. On the other hand, Professor Margolis's distressing uh, shallow end book uh, points out the, yeah, sorry, excellent but distressing book, uh, so excuse me, uh, about the absence of the ability to actually deliver uh, if when people really do want to know this stuff and whether this is Python or C doesn't matter uh, at this level. So really putting an emphasis on creating that. I will also just note that uh, uh, there appear to be a fair number of underemployed IT workers, if you believe various both layoff notices and complaints about H-1Bs because. So in reality, there exist a fair number of people out there with some of the competences if you were willing to figure out how to harness that. And also, more broad, not just trying to create more CS majors, creating you know, biologists who do understand computing, uh, finance engineers, alas, also. But I would really be focusing on how you can harness that knowledge to create the curiosity about the technology, and then, with luck, a decade later, have your next cadre of the creators. Other questions? 
question. How about Bob? And then you. Yeah, this, is, this one works good. Um, I, I'd like to come back to uh, the issue of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work that Mike Nelson raised uh, early on and ask uh, uh, whether the panel believes that there is role in the Niter T program for um, enabling that, improving it, uh, and the like. Every, every time I look at uh, uh, a project that works, I, I tend to see uh, a factor of 10 or more that don't, don't quite work or certainly don't work well. Uh, if you took the simplest example of something that involves two different kind of groups, let, let me start with it, the same discipline. Uh, the fractionation that occurred in the artificial intelligence community when they were asked to start working on applications literally caused labs to go out of operation. Uh, it caused great uh, torment for some of the leading uh, researchers. I remember when speech understanding, which I thought was a pretty technical topic, was first introduced as something that the community could work on. There was some key people in the field who I, I won't uh, embarrass by naming, but who thought that that was actually uh, not a really good idea and uh, the most favorable comment uh, that they could make was I suppose it has some socially redeeming value. It wasn't the core problem in AI, obviously. Um, when we uh, started working on networking way back, this was a real uh, interdisciplinary kind of activity. We were taking computer folks and we were taking network folks and trying to somehow cause some kind of an inner working to take place. This wasn't exactly tight intellectual inner working, but certainly was at the bit level. And uh, that was resisted very strongly up front because this was money that was going to go into networking that could have gone into computer science. And I think in the final analysis, that, that sort of all worked out, but it was difficult. And finally, I, I'm sure some people on the panel have had experience in, in their own institutions with trying to stimulate interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary activities. And the, the, the deepest thinkers in each field tend to resist it because it's a diversion to, from their interests. You know, and the people who are most interested in doing that uh, tend not to be the people that know the most about the field. And so you end up with the less capable of the people working that interface. Um, I'm just wondering whether the panel uh, thinks there's role in this program for dealing with some of these difficult issues of collaboration back and forth in these multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary problems so that we can actually make more progress in those dimensions, getting the best people to be involved in some sense and without uh, causing so much fractionation that uh, people tend to resist and, and actually dislike it. I know lots of people want to answer that, and I'm going to take uh, moderator's privilege and be the, the first one on that. Um, I think it's this is a tremendously important question, and I think this is a space where um, this community can make a tremendous, the NIDR D community can make a tremendous um, uh, progress. I think there's, you know, the need is there. It's pretty clear that most of the complex problems that face us in energy and environment and health, you know, you name it, in safety, um, are interdisciplinary problems. There's just no way to sort of get at them through a pure discipline. Um, that being said, the structures are very weak for us to support it. I think it is hard to fund it across, you know, directorate or agency boundaries. I think that um, within our um, institutions, it's hard to get tenure in interdisciplinary science. We talked about that a little bit. So it's something that either attracts young people or people post-tenure. Um, I think we have a bit of a bias within the academic community for pure things versus more practically oriented things or more application-driven things. Um, I think all of those kind of conspire to make it challenging, but I think all of the tools that we talked about, you know, policy, programs, funding, priorities, all of those could be brought to bear to this particular problem, I think creating a stronger structure to support interdisciplinary science. Um, Philia, did you want to go next yes. on this? Yes. Um, my name is Philia Makedon. I'm a professor and chair of the department at the University of Texas at Arlington. I can speak from personal experience, uh, and I will talk about it in the next panel, the emerging cognition. 
But uh, yes, the challenges are there. But um, I think uh, there are two factors in making interdisciplinary work work. <laughs> uh, one is finding compelling applications. Uh, right now, I'm involved in several interdisciplinary projects with almost two-thirds of the faculty who still pursue their theoretical field, narrow field in computer vision or whatever it is, but um, are working with me in lab-oriented, uh, empirical kind of projects where you have to use basic theory to make sense out of the messy and massive amounts of data. The second aspect is perhaps uh, look at the federal policy of funding. I think that um, incentive and funding mechanisms need to be produced to enhance, um, uh, uh, to, to look at um, cyber infrastructures for such research in a similar level and with the same priority as we look at supercomputing. Uh, I served as uh, program director at the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. I was very fortunate to do that, but it was at the time when it was um, a change, a transition from a program uh, in size to an office. And there I got a glimpse, I don't know what is happening now, of the huge emphasis in giving huge amounts of money for supercomputing, which is very important, but it basically had a few physicists that used these machines. And I think in the same level, we should look at facilities that have a bottom-up and much more uh, engagement by students all the way from high school to uh, tenured faculty. Thank you. Thanks. Someone from the panel wanted to respond to that? Brian? I, I have a question, but I think so, so there was a question by uh, Craig Lee, and after stating NIDA's, uh, NIDA-D's mission, he basically says, how is NIDA-D going to support and promote community building for the development of best practices and common practices that will facilitate the effective adoption and use of these new IT capabilities? And I, I think that touches on several things that have been talked about just in the, in the last few minutes. So we need to build communities that, that cross the industry, academia, uh, government labs in, in ways that uh, we couldn't do before. So, so Mark's suggesting that we actually do a combination REU uh, internship. So, so there, there, there have been barriers to trying to do this. We actually tried to do this 20 years ago uh, when I was at NSF. But there are barriers to trying to do these kinds of things that we have to break down. Um, and, I, and I think this really is a question about how do we build up communities that are effective in solving these new kinds of problems, interdisciplinary problems, to problems of working together, uh, developing students, getting students to work together. Um, Craig, I think you were next. I wanted to pick up on, uh, Craig Stewart, Indiana University, I wanted to pick up on a thread, Fran, that you started and Stu continued and talk about the importance of research, development, and delivery. And I think it's the and delivery part uh, that we want to particularly focus on and I think in so doing, one of the things we could accomplish is delivering more access to authentic science and interest in problem solving to kids throughout the U.S. Uh, so we have two, two related problems. One is uh, not enough focus, not enough funding on the delivery of things once they stop being interesting research projects. Uh, and the other is uh, this tremendous pool of talent that's going untapped throughout the U.S. And in the state of Indiana, it's uh, uh, southwest Indiana and northwest Indiana with completely different problems, uh, but in common the fact that there is tremendous talent that we are not bringing into the pipeline in ways that will let them get through the three or four layers of the sieve that they've got to go through before they are. this joint opportunity to uh, invest in, the th in, in really finishing work well and investing in work that won't pay off for another 5, 10, 15 years, but will pay off in the long run in very handsome ways. We're going to have about, uh, I guess, slightly less than 10 minutes um, for this session. So um, uh, rev up your questions. I want to get one from the Internet. Um, this is from University of Arkansas. Um, and this is about return on investment by industry use of HPC. And um, the question is, 
Um, would NIDRD consider supporting studies that prove the return on investment of high performance computing and networking for academic institutions? And the comment is that although the return may seem obvious to top universities, and the comments by several in the room confirm this, my experience is that the case still needs to be made quantitatively for a large number of academic institutions. Recent studies by ECAR and the Council on Competitiveness are a start in this direction. And um, let me broaden this out, because I think it would be really good to hear from this room on this. If, if you look throughout um, what we all lovingly know as the Branscombe Pyramid, and we look at the very different constituencies and what their needs are now and over the next decade in the future, you know, what can we do to make sure that those needs are met by the information technologies that NIDRD has some, uh, can have some influence over. So uh, let me ask all of you what you think about that. Yes. Um, Cynthia McIntyre with the Council on Competitiveness. And, and the, uh, Can't hear you. Uh, the uh, a person who sent in the email the mic, was citing our, citing our studies. Is it on? OK, very good. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, barriers that, that we found to use of HPC in industry is the, uh, not just the access to the hardware, but having the software capability to use those systems uh, currently. Um, many of the corporations have proprietary codes that they'd like to run on the leadership class systems that the, the U.S. has as, as national strategic assets. But there are um, difficulties in matching uh, their needs to those systems at national laboratories. They don't know who to go to, uh, how to get in, et cetera. So there's, there's that aspect. There's also the need to develop new sources of, of software codes based on um, codes that are running at national labs for various research projects that could be uh, better utilized by industry. And so there's opportunity there for NIDRD to, to um, request that these codes and co software development that's happening at the National Laboratory have a, a greater access um, uh, to the uh, uh, industrial base so that they can have greater access to the codes and to the machines that are, that are out there. There are people uh, in the room besides IBM, who uh, certainly is a source of uh, supercomputing technology in Cray, but we also have Boeing in the a room who's also a, a big user of um, uh, HPC for um, design of, of aircraft. And we've done a, a case study of some of the um, uh, uh, industry use of HPC for their various needs. So. I'd like to, um, uh, I would be derelict in my uh, duty as a data person um, not to bring up the concept of data because pretty much everything we do these days is driven by data of some sort or another which needs some longevity and has some value to some community. Some of it's very large, some of it's very small. And I think we have to couple our information technologies with the notion that data is an integral part of what we do in the information age and we need some sort of um, reasonably comprehensive, structured way of thinking about it because it's going to be, I think, incredibly, you know, more and more important as time goes on. Um, uh, other, other comments? Yes. Uh, Dwayne Adams. There have been a number of people talk about um, some of the problems, whether it's parental involvement or qualified teachers or uh, follow-on funding. It seems to me that there are a lot of these problems that go beyond what NIDRD can do. So the question is, if you're looking at a strategy, how do you reach out to other parts of the government? Uh, whether it's uh, things that may be a law that you need to propose, whether it's working with Department of Education or other agencies. So it, I think the how is what we're coming up with and struggling with, as Mike Nelson pointed out earlier. So I think broadening beyond this group maybe one of the ways that we ought to look at it. There are, I think that's incredibly important because I think uh, the how is, you know, how things get accomplished. And I think this is where the policy and the priorities and the metrics of success, all of those can have great influence. I would love to hear from other folks on that. Yeah. Uh, Mary 
Mary Madison from American Health Information Management uh, Association. Um, I'm struck by the, uh, we feel um, bridging business and research is really important as well as education. And I would recommend just hearing a little bit today um, to include as a part of your public-private um, partnership or alliance or wherever we go forward, to include some of the large um, member-based or trade associations that have incredible um, dissemination power. And they are also working with academic institutions in research, and um, they have some educational training programs. Some of them are distant learning. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that uh, to the conversation today. Thank you. Anybody like the last word, Philia? Um, we are working with a, a nursing school at UTA, which has the famous smart hospital uh, models of simulated humans with sensors, and it has been a very educational experience for me, um, and, and working together and building experiments and empirical research. Thank you. So, Maria, follow up on that, on that last comment? I'd just like to uh, put a hypothesis out there that it's a lot easier to do interdisciplinary teaching and research at both undergraduate colleges and at quote unquote less prestigious <laughs> universities. Because, I mean, I know that at Princeton, as Dean of Engineering, if you didn't, if, if I was mentoring a junior faculty member, if that person didn't establish themselves as the leader among their generation in a very focused area, they would not get tenure. And even if they did that, they might not get tenure. And, you know, I, th I think that one of the things we absolutely need to do is we need to change the culture at R1 universities. And, you know, speaking as somebody who's been at an amazing mix of institutions in my career, I think the only way that is going to happen is by changing the research funding because they really care about how well they do in bringing in major grants. Uh, it really has to be the peer, competitive, peer evaluated grants. But, you know, I think the other thing we need to do is we need to ed educate presidents, provosts, and deans about these issues because this is not something you can change from the bottom up among the faculty. So, so with that, I would like to um, remind us all um, a comment that Bryant made that I found incredibly terrific, um, which was your intellectual stimulus package. And, um, and if you think about education and interest and innovation, it really starts with um, an intriguing idea compellingly told. And I, I, I love the idea that our president would actually start a talk or another with an interesting science problem, but this is something all of us can do and our colleagues can do as well. And so it's just a little drop in the ocean, but you know, it can create some ripples. So you know, I think that's something that our community can do right now without a dime of funding and a, you know, a, a, any kind of policy, but I think it's tremendously important. I wanna thank the panel uh, I want to thank um, Chris and the NIDUD folks for asking us, and um, thanks all, to all of you as well. <laughs>